Forgive me, Alice, for I have sinned. It's been at least 20 years since my last confession. My child, what troubles you? I've been learning about Mary Whitehouse, and it turns out that I'm a filthy sinner. I'm a glutton. I can't stop eating crisps, and I try and ration it. I'll decant some of a share bag of chilli heatwave Doritos into a little bowl to just only have a bit, and then I just decant the whole thing anyway. It's pointless having the bowl. I might as well just tip it all into my mouth, and I can't be stopped. Fifteen Hail Marys and four Our Fathers, and the Lord will forgive you. Thank you. You are a real priest, right? Mm Mm-hmm. October 1976, Birmingham. Mary fidgets in her seat as the tannoy announces the train has reached its final stop, Birmingham New Street. She takes a moment to look out of the window and take in the busy throng of the station concourse. After all these years, she still gets nervous when attending speaking engagements. As she nears the ticket station, she's heartened to see a smiling crowd of teenagers waiting to welcome her on the platform. They're students from the local Bible college. She and Ernest have come here to explain how they can help with Mary's ongoing campaign against the moral decay of Great Britain. She feels a particular sense of pride in shaping these impressionable young minds. Walking through the station, she can't resist leading them into WH Smith, where she proudly picks up that morning's edition of the Daily Mail. Turning to page five, Mary shows them a story about her battle against pornography being sold in newsagents like this. Mary gravely gestures to the top shelf, which is filled with just the kind of filth she's referring to. I ask you, should they be allowed to sell these rags in shops where normal, decent people go? Is nobody thinking about the poor kiddies? Mary's about to lead them out when one top shelf title catches her eye. She feels the colour drain from her face. Her whole body stiffens. Following her gaze, Ernest audibly gasps. As Ernest reaches up for the offending magazine, Mary snatches it off him. She can't quite believe what she's holding. A new pornographic magazine called White House International. What? Mary is sickened. It gets worse when she looks at the cover properly. Next to a busty, pouting blonde, a headline screams, Mary, see her as the world has never seen her. Mary's heartbeat quickens. She dreads to think what infernal images lie within its enticingly glossy pages. Feeling too afraid to look, she passes it back to Ernest, who dutifully flicks to the relevant page. Yeah, she's around page 17 or 18 that they have the... uh, I mean, that's what the lads told me. (laughs) He gravely tells her that the magazine features a column written by a call girl named Mary Whitehouse. It seems her job is to, um go around the country um, sexually testing different men and describing their um, antics. Looking sheepish, Ernest reads out a sample. Jim undressed and we both went into the bedroom together. When we got there, he took out a small pair of leather handcuffs and asked me to cuff him to the bed. Suddenly, she remembers who she's with. She turns to look at the group of students... They're now staring at their feet or distracting themselves with small talk, clearly mortified on Mary's behalf. The last thing she feels like doing is taking them to tea. She's too incensed to brush this off. She has to do something. Mary rushes to the nearest phone box and calls her solicitor. With a purse full of change at the ready, she insists on staying on the line while he looks into what can be done. But coming back to her, He sounds resigned. I'm sorry, Mary. It seems the porn star changed her name to Mary Whitehouse by deed poll. There's nothing we can do to stop her writing what she wants under that name. Mary slams down the phone. In her 12 years campaigning, she's never felt so humiliated or so impotent. She storms back to the shop, where she instructs Ernest and the students to collect up every copy of White House International. Then she takes the lot to the woman behind the cash register. This filth belongs in the bin. The assistant stares back at Mary, nervous. If you don't put them back, I'll have to call the manager. Mary stands up straight, pushes her shoulders back, primed for battle. You do that, dear. It'll make no difference. I'll go to every shop in Birmingham if I have to. Then I'll start in London. I'll visit every newsagent in every single city. I'm cleaning up this country if it's the last thing I do. (laughs) 
From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. Matt, would you say you have any enemies? And this is not because I've received any correspondence. Yes, people who get to the top of an escalator and stop walking. People who let their dog off the lead in a park. And people who litter. They are ruining our country. They are ruining our way of life. I mean, half the listenership of British Scandal is an enemy of yours, just so you know. On the other side, on the plus, that means half aren't. (laughs) That's a very good way of looking at it. Well, that places you in sort of the same camp as Mary Whitehouse, wait for it, not politically or ideologically, but she obviously had a lot of enemies who she saw as, you know, destroying the good Christian way of life. Last episode, we learned that one of those was the director of the BBC. Yes, and that was not a one-sided fight. The way he dealt with that dispute was appalling. I can't get the image of that five-breasted painting out of my mind. And the list goes on. She even took on Doctor Who, and that wasn't enough. And at the end of the last episode, she'd even been featured on a BBC talk show, but she felt like there were bigger fish to fry. I mean, what bigger fish are there? There can't be anyone left in Britain she hasn't gone after. Don't tempt fate, Matt. This is episode two, Courting Disaster. Six years earlier, June 1970, Wolverhampton. Mary sits staring at the magazine on her kitchen table. She can hardly believe the crude image she's looking at. An illustration of Rupert the Bear with an erection. He's engaged in a compromising situation with another cartoon character in the latest issue of a satirical magazine called Oz. It was sent to Mary by one of her supporters, who was horrified when her teenage son brought it home. Mary knows how she feels. She turns to Ernest, tears pricking her eyes. I read the Rupert books to the children when they were small. How could they be allowed to print something like this? Rupert is a bear. Bears do procreate. I mean, it's no different to what Attenborough's doing. (laughs) It's a slippery slope, and Dave is not beyond reproach. Over the past year, Mary has travelled from city to city, campaigning against the inappropriate use of swearing, sex and violence in pop music, TV and film. She's personally recruited thousands of new supporters, and last week she was even invited to Cambridge University to debate the growth of pornographic magazines in the UK. But now, looking at Oz's cover, Mary feels like kicking herself. It's labelled the school kids issue. While she's been distracted by more obvious evils, so-called risque underground magazines like this have been corrupting the country's youth. Risque my foot. This is downright offensive. Furious, Mary picks up the phone and calls the publisher, demanding the issue be withdrawn from sale immediately. But the publisher won't hear of it. You've misunderstood, Mrs Whitehouse. It's called the school kids issue because it was edited by school children, not aimed at them. The cartoon you're upset by was created by a 16-year-old boy. Yeah, I don't think that's the strongest argument. No, I'm kind of with Mary, actually. Mary is stunned. Dragging children into producing this filth is even worse. We should be protecting the young and vulnerable from contamination, not encouraging them. Hanging up, Mary takes out her list of phone numbers for national newspapers. She knows how to whip up a media storm. Under pressure from the press and public, she's sure the publishers will have to rethink. The following day, to Mary's delight, several papers carry the story. Better still, she hears it's to be discussed on a BBC news programme hosted by David Frost that evening. Mary settles herself down in front of the television, looking forward to a public flogging. But instead, Frost interviews the child who drew the cartoon and his mother, and they both appear to be completely unapologetic. There are no rules in our house. This is my son's way of expressing himself. What's wrong with that? It's the final straw for Mary. She switches off the TV and goes into her study. Desperate to find another way of stopping this, she starts leafing through a file of paperwork. She's looking for something, anything that might give her an answer. She stops at a letter from the Director of Public Prosecutions. She wrote to him last year, complaining that a TV special that showed Jimi Hendrix simulating masturbation with his guitar was obscene. I can't imagine which bit of the guitar. (laughs) 
In that instance, she was told no charges would be brought. But Mary wonders, could this be different? There's only one way to find out. Mary picks up the phone and dials the number for Scotland Yard's obscene publication squad. This is Mary Whitehouse. I'd like to bring a very serious matter to your attention. Mary is determined that if Oz's publishers and the BBC won't deal with this correctly, the law courts will. A year later, June 1971, the Old Bailey, London. Stepping into court two, Geoffrey Robertson takes a moment to stop and catch his breath. At 24, he's still getting used to the grandeur of this famous courthouse and being part of such a high-profile case. But here he is, junior counsel for the defence of the men who have become known as the Oz Three. The magazine's publishers, Richard Neville and Jim Anderson, and its business manager, Felix Dennis. Robertson smiles at the sight of the defendants as they enter the dock. Today, like most days, they're dressed as schoolgirls, their long dark locks tied up in bunches and freckles painted on their smirking faces. I mean, I think most people would say, if you're going to court, put on your best suit, shirt and tie. Like, that's the clichés that even scallywags find a tie for the day. What are these guys playing at? I guess part of what they're defending is the right to be controversial and subversive. Yeah, and there is a proud tradition in this country of satire and vulgarity. Punch magazine, Private Eye, even Viz combine all those things. So the legacy of those sort of publications predates Oz and is still with us today. The charges brought against them, the most serious being conspiracy to commit an obscene act, could lead to a prison term if they're found guilty. But to Robertson's joy, they remain defiant. His colleague, leading prosecuting QC John Mortimer, sighs despairingly. I love them, but they do themselves no favours. Robertson knows Mortimer is right. Mortimer is the country's leading human rights lawyer, and Robertson feels honoured to be working alongside him. He was hoping this case would give him a chance to impress Mortimer. But it's been a struggle. And one major thorn in his side has been the woman now entering the public gallery, Mary Whitehouse. Robertson darkens as he watches her and her cohorts taking their seats, pointedly holding up Bibles. Whitehouse is everything Australian-born Robertson can't stand about British society. A small-minded version of morality that clings to the past. As he catches her eye, she purses her lips and quickly looks away, as if staring at him too long might somehow contaminate her. Robertson finds himself chuckling. What else can he do? It's like going into battle with his grandmother. But Robertson's good mood fades when Judge Justice Argyle enters. He's the most humorless man Robertson has ever encountered and is clearly on White House's side. Since day one, they've been on the back foot. The Crown Prosecutor has made it his primary tactic to focus only on the dirty parts of Oz magazine, ignoring its satirical and parodic intentions. Several expert witnesses who Robertson arranged for the defence, including comedian Marty Feldman, DJ John Peel and jazz singer George Melly, were even asked about their own sexual activities. Today, out of desperation, Mortimer calls a child psychologist to testify that even if any children were to see the Rupert cartoon, they're unlikely to be disturbed by it. I would question the expertise of that witness. I mean, that is a long shot, isn't it? How do you prove it? You show a load of kids the cartoon, and then you say, come back to me in 15 years? His colleague does such an excellent job that by the time Leary stands to cross-examine, face puce with rage, Robertson thinks he may burst with anger. Surely the main point about this cartoon is that Rupert the Bear is behaving in a way one would not expect a little bear to behave. The psychologist looks utterly perplexed. I'm very sorry, I'm not up to date with the behaviour of bears. (laughs) There's laughter from the gallery. Robertson thinks surely this will at least raise a smile from Argyle. Instead, he's clearly furious. I will clear the court if I hear any more laughter. Robertson's heart sinks. His anxiety is only compounded by the judges summing up. Don't you find this magazine disgusting? Don't you find it embarrassing and offensive? If you've been shocked or distressed by the evidence you've heard, you should return a guilty verdict today. It's incredible how much he's leading the jury there. When the jury returns, it's as Robertson feared. 
Found guilty, the three editors are given custodial sentences of between 9 and 15 months. Robertson leaves the courtroom feeling crushed, but he's heartened by the sight that greets him outside the Old Bailey. A massive demonstration, led by John Lennon and Yoko Ono, is already underway. The ex beatle has even written a special song of support called God Save Oz. The crowd cheers him on as he sings it. Nearby, celebrities including Alec Guinness and Mick Jagger wave banners. Fired up, Robertson turns to Mortimer. Argyle blatantly misdirected the jury. That's grounds for an appeal, right? Mortimer nods and Robertson heads straight to Chambers to get started. He has no intention of letting the likes of Argyle and White House win. This culture war has only just begun. It's three months later, November 1971, the Royal Court of Justice. Mary can barely contain her fury as she speaks to the reporters gathered outside the courthouse. This is a disaster for morality. I could not be more shocked and horrified by the decision of the appeal court. Mary still can't believe that the Court of Appeal has just quashed the convictions of the Oz Three. She's interrupted by the sound of jeers and laughter from nearby protesters. Mrs Whitehouse, the Appeal Court criticised Justice Argyle's behaviour in the original trial, finding he made five major errors of law and 72 errors of fact, as a result of which these men spent three months in prison. Surely you can't agree with that. Before Mary can formulate an answer, the reporters rush to the other side of the road, where the freed prisoners stand with their legal team, ready to give a statement. All three men sport crew cuts rather than the long hair they wore through the trial. Much has been made of the fact that their heads were shaved when they entered Wormwood Scrubs prison, and many of today's crowd wear shaved heads as a show of solidarity. As the men begin to read their statements, Mary makes eye contact with their junior counsel. Jeffrey Robertson is barely out of nappies, as far as Mary is concerned. She's appalled that even the law courts are now overrun with these hippies. She's done her research on Robertson. Just like communist sympathiser John Mortimer, he's another Oxford-educated elite, intent on undermining the Christian values of British society under the banner of free speech. There's so much in that, isn't there? She hates him because he's young, left-wing, a hippie, elitist, and he's an atheist. It's the full bingo card. I mean, that is like the ultimate culture war lens, isn't it? Like, literally everything about him drives her mad. Returning home, Mary finds Ernest watching the news. I suppose you saw what happened. Ernest nods. Maybe it's time to take a break. Go on that holiday we're always talking about. Mary looks at him like he's insane. If this proves anything, it's that we have to fight back harder than ever. Mobilise more ordinary, decent people, just like we did against the BBC in the 60s. What we need is an army. A few phone calls later, Mary is convinced politician Lord Longford, journalist Malcolm Muggeridge and Bishop Trevor Huddleston that they should form a new movement. We're calling it the Nationwide Festival of Light. We're going to march the streets, spreading the word of the Lord, encouraging Oz's readers to denounce this evil. Mary is determined to harness the power of her supporters and her faith and use it for good. A year later, Christmas Day, 1972, Wolverhampton. In the kitchen, Mary bastes the turkey. She wants everything to be perfect for today's lunch. She usually keeps Christmas low-key, despairing of the commercialism that has hijacked the birth of Christ. But this year, a newspaper reporter wants to pop by to capture a White House family Christmas, and Mary knows how important it is to keep the publicity machine running. She turns up the radio as she works. A current affairs show reviewing the year's key events brings a smile to her face. The presenter is talking of how tireless lobbying by Mary's Festival of Light movement led to director Stanley Kubrick withdrawing his film, A Clockwork Orange, from circulation in the UK. That's why he withdrew it. Because of our Mary. I never knew that. The decision by Kubrick followed weeks of uncomfortable debate over the film, which even saw the director receiving death threats. Mary quickly switches the programme off, 
not so keen to be reminded of that detail. But as her son Chris enters the room, his expression tells her he's already heard. Fun, was it, putting someone's life in danger? Maybe if he'd thought of that before making such a disgusting film. Chris snorts derisively. Mary sighs. She's finding it harder and harder to keep her youngest in check these days. The older boys seem happy to let her get on with her campaign, but Chris has fought her all the way. Noting the magazine under his arm, Mary darkens. It's the latest issue of Oz. How dare you bring that filthy rag into this house? Give it to me. Chris whips it out of her grasp and stomps up to his room. Mary races after him. She will not have such insolence. Flinging open his bedroom door, she sees Chris stuff something under his mattress. Oh, no. Mary pushes him aside, snatching the offending magazine. She feels victorious, until she realises she's not holding a copy of Oz. The magazine in her hands is called Saucy. Mary flicks through the pages. They show naked girl after naked girl doing all manner of depraved things. She looks up at Chris. He's blushing furiously. Where did you get this? Have you been going to sex shops? I got it from the newsagent like everyone else. For Christ's sake, I'm 25. Mary feels the bile rise in her stomach. She can't believe her own son is buying this filth. Mary's about to give him a piece of her mind when the doorbell rings. To her horror, the journalist is early. Go back downstairs. I will not let you ruin this for me. A few minutes later, Mary ushers a reporter and photographer into the sitting room, where Ernest and sons Paul, Richard and Chris sit dutifully round the table. The turkey with all the usual trimmings sits in the centre, surrounded by tinsel, crackers and other decorations. Mary has gone all out. She steals a look at Chris. He's staring into his melon starter. As the photographer snaps away, she launches into her spiel. This is how we always spend Christmas. We eat at 2pm on the dot so we can be done in time for the Queen's speech. Every year I spend weeks making a special Christmas cake for us to eat while she's on. Then we open presents. I'm a stickler for tradition. There's a snort from Chris's direction. Mary freezes, hoping the reporter will ignore him. But instead, he turns Chris's way. And do you enjoy that, Chris? A big traditional family Christmas? Mary eyeballs Chris willing him to behave. Oh yes, this is great. Mary almost collapses with relief. But then... Except you're not traditional in every way, are you, Mum? Did she mention her and my dad sleep in separate bedrooms? Have done for as long as I can remember. He must be the only kid in the country that's trying to shame his mum and dad into having sex. (laughs) The reporter and photographer eye each other, awkward. In shock, Mary quickly flusters a response. I don't think anyone's interested in our sleeping arrangements, Christopher. But Chris isn't done. She's always banging on about how she's got nothing against sex, how it's very healthy when it's part of a loving marriage. Not part of hers, though. It's all a lie. Just like this whole Christmas panto she's got going here. Mary's eyes burn into Chris's. All she can do is watch as he slams his chair back and leaves the table. Ernest quickly offers their visitors some eggnog, but Mary knows the damage is done. This is the story the paper will run with tomorrow. Later, when the press have gone, Mary charges up to Chris's room, ready to read him the riot act, but she's thrown by the sight that greets her. The wardrobe is empty, as is the room. Chris is gone. Mary sees a note on the bed. She sits down beside it, looks around the room, feels a lump in her throat. She remembers Ernest building this bed, now threadbare and sagging in the middle from years of cradling Chris's growing body. She picks up the note and nervously thumbs the paper in her hand. She can't bring herself to read it. She knows what it's likely to say, that she's a terrible mother, more concerned with her campaigning than with her family. Why can't he understand that she's doing it all for him, for his future children? Jesus made sacrifices, and so must she. She replaces the unread note and instead picks up the copy of Saucy magazine. Holding it in her hands, she thinks about how Oz and Saucy have been polluting her youngest son's mind, 
poisoning it against all that's pure and good. Against her. That's what's really to blame for all this. Popular music, violent films, pornography. Mary resolves to double her efforts against them all. She can't bear the thought of anyone else losing their child to this poison. She won't let this contagion do more damage than it's already done. To her family or anyone else's. Four years later, October 1976, Wolverhampton. In her sitting room, Mary watches the six o'clock news with glee. It shows a group of protesters waving placards, denouncing pornography and chanting loudly outside White House International HQ. They've been dispatched there by Mary, following the launch of the soft porn magazine mockingly named after her. Mary has made slow but significant progress with her anti-filth campaign over the past few years. She's persuaded several local councils to protest against the screening of films like Degrading Satire, Blowout, Violent Horror Flick, The Exorcist, and Sexually Graphic, The Last Tango in Paris. And following her fallout with Chris, she's launched a one-woman war against the pornography industry. The current UK laws surrounding magazines are imprecise, so Mary's gone directly to MPs in an effort to have them rewritten. Mary is prepared to play the long game when it comes to the porn barons. She knows real change won't happen overnight. Whatever I think about her politics or her values or whatever she's trying to achieve, you do have to respect her as a formidable campaigner. She really understands how to get things done. Also, people tend to underestimate her and not expect her to go the distance, so that acts in her favour as well. And her opponents seem to make it personal in a really degrading way, whether it's that painting inside the BBC or getting a porn star to change her name by Depol to Mary Whitehouse. Those sorts of tactics are appalling and she's right, at the very least, to be appalled by those moments. Yeah, if you can't attack her policy and you have to attack her as a woman, you lose any moral high ground. Later that evening, she tries to relax by watching the darts. When Ernest comes home, he hands her a copy of Gay News. Oh, Ernest, must I? I don't think I can take any more today. You'll want to see this. One of the Festival of Light members brought it to my attention. Mary reluctantly thumbs through to the marked page, trying to ignore the lurid images. Her eyes widen as she reads a poem called The Love That Dares to Speak Its Name by writer and English professor James Kirkup. It details, in graphic language, the crucifixion of Christ seen through the eyes of a homosexual Roman centurion. The tough, lean body of a man no longer young, beardless, breathless, but well hung. It goes on to describe the centurion having sex with Jesus' dead body. Mary is appalled. Is there no end to the vilification of Christ these days? And this is propagated by homosexuals. It's as sinful as it gets. She gets straight on the phone to her solicitor, Graham Ross Corns. I agree with you, Mary. If this poem isn't blasphemous, nothing ever could be. But I can't see the Crown prosecution taking action, not after the furore of the Oz trial. Mary can't believe it, but she won't be dissuaded that easily. What about if I prosecute privately? Ross Corns pauses for a beat before answering. Uh, you could, but if you lose, it would prove very costly, both financially and reputationally. Mary looks across at Ernest. A court case could cost thousands. She could blow her and Ernest's entire savings. They could even lose their home. But she's already having to put up with the pornographers. She can't let the blasphemers gain ground. Well then, I'd better not lose. Mary's mind is made up. If the Crown won't take action, she will, whatever the personal cost. Eight months later, the 12th of July, 1977, the Old Bailey, London. In courtroom one, Mary is unable to hide the wide grin on her face as she sits beside barrister John Smith, waiting for proceedings to begin. It's day eight of Mary's blasphemy trial against Gay News and its editor, Dennis Lemon, 
And so far, it's gone better than she could ever have hoped. The judge, Justice King Hamilton, is clearly sympathetic to her beliefs. He denied the defence a chance to address the jury with their opening argument and even ruled out several of their key witnesses. I thought Justice Argyle was bad, but that's effectively rigging the trial. As King Hamilton takes his seat, Smith leans towards Mary. Just the closing arguments now, Mary. Nothing bar a minor miracle will see us lose today. Mary watches as defence barrister Geoffrey Robertson rises to his feet. She hoped she'd seen the last of him at the Oz Appeal, but he's made quite a name for himself since. He looks at her now with the same smug smile he directed her way six years ago. Mary almost admires his bravado. He must know he's beaten, yet like so many of his entitled Oxbridge ilk, he still displays an air of superiority. She contents herself with the knowledge Robertson will be put in his place soon enough. I hope members of the jury will indulge me as I read you some passages from the Bible. Ooh, this just got interesting. Fight fire with fire. And brimstone. (laughs) Mary's confused. Robertson has always called himself a Protestant sceptic publicly. Since when did he know anything of the Lord's teachings? But he goes on to explain he's been studying the Bible carefully and his interpretation is that Jesus is supportive of the gay experience in Kirkup's poem. Here are the words of the communion service. This is my body. Eat this. This is my blood. Drink this. Mary grips the side of the bench, sickened. When she manages to focus on the jury they seem almost mesmerised by the gentle tone of Robertson's voice. The fact is that Christ was a man, just as capable of sin as any other man. In addition to this, the Bible says God loves all people. It offers a moral code that all should be treated equally. That surely includes sinners and homosexuals, does it not? That is a masterstroke because he's using... Effectively, her superpower against her. He's using the one thing she's got as her moral code to prove her wrong. Mary's horrified. She notices some of the jury glance at Dennis Lemon. It's that compassion that she sees in their eyes. Mary can only pray that Judge King Hamilton's closing speech brings the jury back to their senses. The defence has repeatedly told you that blasphemy itself is now a dead letter in modern times but a law's antiquity does not stop it being valuable and relevant. And anyway, the motives behind this poem are, in legal terms, strictly irrelevant. It matters not what Kirkup meant when he wrote it, not in the face of the offence it has caused. It's a strong argument, clearly skewed Mary's way. But Mary can't be sure it's enough. During her agonising wait for the jury to return she forces herself to consider what it would mean to lose. The humiliation would be bad enough, but the expense of paying legal fees and damages to Lemon and Gay News would be worse. It could ruin her. The jury file in one by one. She waits, drumming her fingers against the wooden bench. How do you find the defendants? Guilty. Mary almost sobs with relief. Dennis Lemon is fined £500 and the magazine £1,000. They're also ordered to pay Mary's costs of £7,763. Mary feels triumphant. Gay News is a modest operation with a small staff. This could be enough to close it. It's a wonderful result. Leaving court, it's now Mary's turn to throw Robertson a smug smile. The mob of libertarian protesters shout Philistine and censorship! As she passes, they seem even more riled up than usual. Some even throw rotten eggs. But Mary ignores them. Not only has she won, the success of this test case could open the door to all manner of similar legal challenges. It's a massive step forward. Mary feels like she could take on the world. And that's exactly what she intends to do. That is a watershed moment, because once you're allowing people to prosecute on obscenity charges, it's entirely subjective. Anything deemed mildly offensive could put you in prison. 
And maybe we would have thought of something like this being about broadcast media, but the fact that it's a poem, so you can do this when it comes to art, there is no limit. And more pernicious is that it's about sexuality. This is defending the right to be prejudiced. You could end up in jail for your sexuality, and that is deeply regressive. A year later, September 1978, Sydney, Australia. Mary squints against the bright sunlight as she walks out of Kingswood Smith International Airport. She feels a surge of energy as she makes her way to the waiting car. A group of reporters rush over to meet her, and Mary smiles, pleased to find she's just as newsworthy on the opposite side of the world. Are you aware of the uproar amongst the city's gay community over your visit here, Mrs Whitehouse? Mary's taken aback. She wasn't. Following Mary's victory against gay news, the vitriol back home has been brutal. It's not just the Gay Liberation Front and the usual libertarian groups. Her bookings for speaking engagements have all but dried up. And much of her correspondence to former friends, like the latest chairman of the BBC, Michael Swan, has gone unanswered. Meanwhile, a fighting fund launched for gay news has raised over £26,000 to date including a donation of £500 from the Monty Python boys. James Kirkup's poem has been published in several UK magazines as a show of solidarity. The editor of New Humanist even put an ad in the Church Times, offering to post the poem to anyone who sends him a stamped addressed envelope. Mary, both here and in the UK, the poem is reaching more people than it ever would have without your intervention. Do you accept that prosecuting was a mistake? Mary can't help wondering if it was. Before the gay news trial, she was making progress with the fight to tighten laws surrounding pornography. She'd also started looking into how child protection laws could be strengthened. But the last 12 months have been continually overshadowed by questions like these. But as usual, she fronts it out. I have no regrets. I was merely trying to defend the rights of Christians. The judge himself said he hoped that in this era of obscenity, the verdict meant that the pendulum of public opinion is swinging back to a healthier climate. Mary gets into the car. She can't wait to get to the sanctuary of the rally, where like-minded Christians will be waiting to support her. Stepping onto the stage an hour later, Mary is reassured. She's attracted a massive crowd. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today. I only wish I was able to talk to you about something more pleasant. There's a ripple of applause, but it's quickly drowned out by shouting. Mary strains to hear what words are being used, but the tone of hostility is unmistakable. She steals herself for the usual heckling, but then, squinting beyond the sunshine she sees a large surge in the crowd. They gather speed, becoming more vocal as they near the stage. Now able to see the banners they're waving, Mary gasps in horror. There's a mocked-up picture of her with a meat cleaver plunged into her back. The caption underneath reads, Let the blood flow. Before Mary can catch her breath, several hulking men are clambering on stage, locking eyes with one, she sees only rage. Something hits her hard in the chest. Terrified, she looks down and is almost relieved to see whipped cream. Then she feels another thud on her torso and another. She's being pelted with cream pies. Suddenly a pair of hands grip Mary's shoulders. She's powerless to resist as she's dragged from the stage. Mary's never feared for her life before, but she does now. She almost collapses with relief as she turns around to see her assailant is in fact a security guard. I'm sorry if I scared you, Mrs Whitehouse. We had to get you out of there. You might want to call this whole thing off. It could get a lot nastier. Mary's overwhelmed with fear. But whatever the public thinks of her, both at home and abroad, she's never been intimidated out of speaking publicly before. She can't let it happen now. Wiping the cream from her dress, she shoots the guard a defiant glare. Then she tries to look calm as she walks back on stage. Mary picks up the microphone, intent on resuming her speech. But now the protesters are so loud, she's completely drowned out. 
With growing horror, she makes out what they're chanting. White House, kill, kill, kill. Mary's head starts to spin. She feels beads of sweat form on her brow. Before she knows it, her legs buckle and she feels the hard stage hit the side of her face. All she can make out are silhouetted figures and the low hum of the crowd as the full force of the last year hits her. She feels utterly exhausted. Nothing left to give. For the first time in her life, she's been silenced. Three days later, September 1978, Gibraltar. Mary closes her eyes and listens to the gentle sound of waves lapping. The smell of seafood cooking in a small beach hut nearby fills the air. The next thing Mary knows, a smiling Ernest stands over her, holding a freshly mixed cocktail in each hand. Thought you could use some refreshment. It's called a Shirley Temple, no alcohol. Mary beams as she takes one. Don't mind if I do. Ernest sits beside her and they gaze out at the sea together. Mary realises he was right all along. They should have done this a long time ago. And after the hostility she faced in Australia, she finally agreed to take a holiday. But old habits die hard. Mary still feels the pull of the campaign invading her thoughts. She's certain the whole thing will be falling apart without her. Later, when Ernest is having an afternoon snooze, She sneaks off and calls one of her volunteers back home. Don't worry, Mary, it's really quiet. Nothing new to report. You enjoy the rest of your break. Mary hangs up, dejected. Was she wrong to take her eye off the ball and come here? Has it made her lose even more momentum? Or is this something bigger? This is the problem when you're a campaigner, is that it gives you such energy and focus and drive... You become addicted to the constant motion of campaigning. So even if you're achieving things that you want, you need to move on to the next thing. People never say, oh, well, that campaign was a success. I'm going to go and do something else. They want the next hit. She wanders back to the beach. As she walks, Mary glances at a young family building a sandcastle together, the young children joyfully playing. She's reminded of the sacrifices she's made. Chris never visits. Her other sons now have young children of their own, who she's barely met. Has it been worth it? An hour later, she gently shakes Ernest awake. I've made an important decision. Ernest rubs his eyes and puts his glasses back on. Then he nods, looking defeated. I knew it. I'll get packing. No, you won't. We're staying another week. And when we get home, I'm retiring. Ernest looks utterly flawed. But Mary has made up her mind. This campaign has gone as far as it can with me in charge. I'm 69 now. It's time I handed the reins to someone else. Ernest beams. Mary feels a surge of relief, but it's tinged with regret. She can only pray she's doing the right thing. May 1979, Ardley, Essex. Mary leaves the local polling station filled with hope. This election has excited her more than most, with the prospect of a woman taking power for the first time, and a Conservative at that. Now Mary's vote is cast, there's nothing left to do but wait and hope. Mary may be winding down her own campaigning career, but that hasn't stopped her from throwing her full support behind Margaret Thatcher in the run-up to the general election. Having moved to this area a few months ago, Mary has made her presence felt by tirelessly doorstepping locals. She's also written to the Tory leader personally to wish her good luck. Mary sees a lot in common with Thatcher. They're both committed Christians from hard-working backgrounds, driven by a calling to do something important with their lives. Arriving home, Mary finds a 25-year-old girl from the local church group waiting. She's yet another potential replacement to lead Mary's anti-filth campaign. Mary's seen several people already, and none have impressed her. But today she tries to keep an open mind. Please don't be nervous. Why don't you tell me why you like the campaign? Well, Mrs Whitehouse, I've been an admirer of yours for as long as I can remember, 
Even at school, I felt very strongly that so much modern TV doesn't reflect the Christian values of me and my friends. Mary nods along, impressed. She likes this girl. Maybe the search is finally over. It makes me so happy to hear you say that. So many programmes these days are obsessed with sex and violence, but not all young people want that. We want more innocent fun, like the goodies. Mary darkens at the mention of the goodies. She'd initially thought that the comedy sketch show would be good, clean fun. She even wrote a letter to the producer to congratulate him. But it's as if her endorsement was considered the ultimate insult, because since then, the show has gone out of its way to offend her. Last week, it had even featured a character called Desiree Carthorse, who suggests making a clean sex education film with no mention of the word sex. It's clearly a parody of Mary. Mary quickly ushers the young lady out, practically slamming the door in her face. She's starting to wonder if anyone else can be trusted to run her campaign. But her mood improves when she switches on the TV the following morning. The Conservatives have won by a landslide. Mary can't contain her excitement. I must send my congratulations. Within minutes, Mary is on the telephone, dialing the number for Whitehall. This is Mrs Mary Whitehouse. I'd like to pass on a message to Margaret Thatcher. Hold on. After a couple of minutes, a familiar voice comes onto the line. Mrs Whitehouse, how wonderful to speak to you at last. There's no mistaking it. The voice on the other end of the phone is Thatcher's. Yes, I thought we'd used an actual recording. (laughs) Mary can't believe she's been granted a conversation with a new PM herself, on her first day in office. For once, she's utterly speechless. I was planning on getting in touch. We seem to be on the same wavelength over a great many things. Not least the breakdown of the traditional family unit and the good Christian values that have served this country so well in the past. Would you be interested in discussing all this further, face to face? Mary feels a swell of pride. Has she, a humble housewife and mother from a small village in Birmingham, just been invited to meet with the Prime Minister? Mary returns to the kitchen to find Ernest clearing away the breakfast dishes. She feels a little guilty. He won't be happy. But Mary knows he'll understand. He always has. She steals herself as he turns to face her. My retirement plans will have to wait. Maggie Thatcher has just invited me to Downing Street for tea. This is the second episode in our series, The Queen of Clean. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Quite Contrary in Autobiography and Mightier Than the Sword, both by Mary Whitehouse. Ban This Filth, Letters from the Mary Whitehouse Archive by Ben Thompson. And you can watch Banned, The Mary Whitehouse Story on BBC iPlayer. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. Wendy Granditer wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samiz Dat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gilardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. The senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Jenny Lower Beckman, Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louie for wondering.